Hello, it's noon on Monday. On today's show, I'll be speaking to Dr. Hazrina Begum, criminologist and senior lecturer from the Faculty of Law at UM. She talks to us about corporal punishment. But just before that, Nordin Abdullah walks us through the infrastructure projects between Thailand and Malaysia. We will also be discussing global energy. You're watching The Brief right here on Burnama TV. We begin the news in brief with this. The Prime Minister congratulated Aaron Chia and So Wu Yik for creating history for the country by winning the men's doubles title at the World Badminton Championships in Tokyo yesterday. Dato Siri Ismail Sabri Yaakob says the victory was a meaningful gift for the country in celebrating its 2022 National Day on August 31st. In the final at the Tokyo Metropolitan Gymnasium, Malaysians beat Indonesians a former three-time world champions 21-19, 21-14 in 40 minutes. And ahead of the National Day celebration, the Prime Minister calls on the entire Malaysian family to come together in defending the independence that was gained through the struggles of our past heroes. Hari Kebangsaan 2022 themed Malaysian Family Strong Together will be celebrated this Wednesday on a large scale from the beginning. Uh, from, that begins at 7 a.m. at Dataran Merdeka, where 50,000 people are expected to be present. And just days away uh, from our National Day celebration at Merdeka Square that's happening this Wednesday, Malaysians have been advised not to fly drones without approval from the authorities to ensure the safety of the celebration. According to the Civil Aviation Authority, it is also to avoid any untoward incident that would involve public safety and the Air Force aircraft. They will be flying low in low formation in the area. Lots of excitement building up with our National Day celebration in just a couple of days. In other news, the government has agreed to continue with the ceiling price for the standard chicken uh, at nine ringgit and forty cent per kilogram. The cabinet reached the unanimous decision last week on Friday, adding that the government also decided not to float chicken prices in response to the feedback from several quarters. Further details regarding the decision will be announced after the special task force on jihad against inflation's meeting happening later today. And the 2023 school academic calendar, which runs from March, will remain as scheduled. According to the Senior Education Minister, several factors have been taken into consideration in preparation or in preparing the school calendar, including the possibility of floods in the East Coast states at the end of the year. With the existing calendar, lear le learning momentum continues. There was always uh, a, long, a long lull after SPM. Apparently, this system will also help to shorten that weight. So, a slight shift in our calendar, education calendar system there. Malaysia and Thailand have agreed to expedite the implementation of infrastructure projects, especially at the border, to enhance trade activities and relations between the people of the two countries. Does all this point, of course, uh, point to border security give us uh, a little bit of a sense of how that is happening but before that I will need Nordin here um, on the airwaves Nordin Abdullah our crisis management analyst joining us Nordin uh, back to what I was saying Malaysia and Thailand have agreed to expedite the implementation of infrastructure projects uh, we know that this of course will enhance trade activities between the two countries which have already had a long-standing relationship is this all pointing now to border security uh, give us a sense of how important uh, this is for the country. Two parts here, Jesse. One, I think, is the, uh, the civilian infrastructure. When we start to look at the, the roads, the rail, and, of course, the communications infrastructure that we need to get right. Uh, and I think this is where the, the two governments have started to look at how to plan and ensure that this uh, is, is done in a meaningful way. Uh, of course, 
then that will lead to increased amounts of, of trade between the, the two countries. Of course, we're seeing a lot of already existing agricultural trade as well as tourism uh, across the border. But one of the key areas now when we start to look at that is, is the need to increase the level of, of uh, security infrastructure. And, and for me, I, I put that into two areas. One is the military uh, security as well as civil defense. Uh, of course, we also have the areas of, of cybersecurity and the issues of ensuring that, uh, you know, there's no further uh, uh, illegal movement across the border, whether it's uh, illegal uh, trafficking of people or, or, or just illegal movement. So all of this has become a, a key issue for Malaysia and Thailand as we start to be more important uh, in global supply chains, uh, simply because... Uh, a lot of global supply chains are now looking at uh, the source of labor and ensuring that it's sustainable sources of labor uh, without any kind of human trafficking involved. So this is one area I think Malaysian government has, has really started to get right in terms of right. uh, uh, getting the infrastructure there. Okay, from that, let's move on. Um, Asia is giving the once shunned nuclear power industry a second lease on life, noting thanks to global energy crisis. Governments in Japan and South Korea are removing anti-nuclear policies, while China and India are looking to build more reactors to avoid future supply shortages and curb emissions. Even developing nations across Southeast Asia are exploring atomic technology. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Um, have basically, have we learned how to manage nuclear waste well this is the good thing uh you know we, we've had nuclear technology since world war ii uh and and some of the, the the recent studies that we've seen is actually the level of uh of you know when we're talking about becquerel's program uh in terms of the waste uh material coming out of nuclear reactors uh and the ability to manage that uh either in a normal scenario or in a disaster related scenario is actually improved uh, considerably. Uh, and then if we look at it uh, in terms of sheer volume, uh, you know, we, we look at things like the, the coal, uh, coal-fired uh, and, and coal ash. Actually, there is a, a, a considerable amount of uh, levels of radioactivity in, in, that, uh, things, uh, in, the, in that residue. So the question is not just thinking of it as, as, as waste. Uh, it's actually to think of it as in the context of uh, circular economy uh, and ensuring that uh, all of these components are then used uh, correctly uh, throughout the economy uh, on an ongoing basis. The, 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 for me, the real elephant in the room is the, uh, the, the energy security that we're faced with. Uh, you know, and we see not just uh, in Asia, but uh, Europe has also realized that energy uh, is is a key component of national security. And without energy security, you, you can't get food security right, you can't get border security right, uh, and you're not going to have a happy population. So energy security and, and managing it sustainably uh, and ensuring that uh, all of the uh, you know, life cycle of all of the components of that energy solution uh, are dealt with in a, in a sustainable and meaningful way is going to be the way forward. I think there's still plenty of work to be done uh, in terms of communications and in terms of getting it right. Uh, but when countries like Japan, China, uh, South Korea are moving in that direction, you can rest assured there's going to be a lot more technology thrown at this and a lot more um, brains put in there. Thank you, Nordin, for weighing in and sharing your perspective there. Nuclear technology and, of course, also the relationship between Malaysia and Thailand in terms of infrastructure projects. It's time for a quick breather. When I come back, I speak to Hazrina Begum. She joins me. We discuss corporal punishment. And right after this break, we'll be right back. See you soon. In business, according to analysts, the ringgit opened lower against the U.S. dollar on Monday due to the lack of buying interest. Today, one U.S. dollar is four ringgit and 47 sen against the greenback from Friday's close of four ringgit and 46 sen. 
At the share market, Bursa opened lower today on risk-averse mode, taking its cue from Wall Street's sharp drop on Friday. At 5 past 9 this morning, KLCI fell by 16.29 points to 1484 from last Friday's closing of 1500.29. And briefly, gold is 240 ringgit 86 cent per gram. That's down 2 ringgit 73 cent from last Friday. Now, here's an update from Bank Nagara. Short term rates are expected to remain stable today on its operations to absorb surplus liquidity from the financial system. Liquidity is estimated at 46.94 billion ringgit in the conventional system and 31.98 billion ringgit in Islamic funds. And in international business, the shipment of China's first large-scale import of fresh fruit from Kenya arrived in the Shanghai port last Friday. 45 tons of avocados imported from Kenya, the largest exporter of the fruit in Africa, are now going through customs declarations and quarantine inspections. Not so long ago, China announced the establishment of the Green Channel for African agricultural products to China to further deepen agricultural exchanges with Africa. Well, we move into Monday's feature. The current caning system used in Malaysia is seen as harsh and, more importantly, inhumane. At this time, I'm joined by Dr. Hazrina Begum Abdul Hamid, a criminologist and senior lecturer with the Faculty of Law at UM, to get her perspective on corporal punishment. Hazrina, thanks for joining us. I'd like to start with this. What are the offences punishable by caning in Malaysia currently? Hi, Jesse. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, as you know, um, there's the caning punishment in Malaysia. So it's usually imposed on offences which are violent in nature and also non-violent offences. Now, this weeping is actually first introduced by the British in the 19th century and it's still ongoing in Malaysia. So among the offences which allows weeping are serious offences such as rape, incest, um, theft, robbery, kidnapping, extortion, trafficking in firearms and drug trafficking. It's also inflicted for less serious offences such as illegal immigration, uh, bribery and criminal breach of trust. Um, and um, there are three groups that are exempted from being whipped, eh, from caning, that's women um, and men above age of 50, except for those convicted of rape and unnatural offences and those who are sentenced to death. All right. So, Hasrina, should Malaysia maintain this particular system? Uh, you know, if just perhaps you could tell us yes or no. Um, if we are going to replace the system, then what needs to be done and what would be fair or a fair balance in terms of sentences meted out? Give us a perspective of, of, of your view on this. All right, for my view, <laughs> no, it should not be maintained. For me, to, in my opinion, it's outdated and archaic. Um, and not to mention its um, infliction of harm, okay? It's, it's a form of torture. So um, in my opinion, it should be maintained or abolished because it mounts to torture, inhumane and degrading treatment. And this is also in contravention with the Convention Against Torture, the UN Convention, okay? So if we look at um, caning, uh, caning is an infliction of pain and it's a harmful act. So as much as we do not want to inflict harm on others, the state should also not impose harmful punishment to offenders such as judicial uh, prison caning. So as you can see in the pictures also, that's how caning has been carried out. Um, and um, caning is at the moment is legalized by court orders and is carried out in prison. So as right, of has, now... Has Rina, do, we, do we know... Or rather, what do we know about how a person functions after a few strokes? What are the effects? Um, there's definitely going to be breaking of the skin. So, and also it depends on how thick the cane is. For violent offences, there are thicker canes. For less violent offences, there are thinner canes. So there's definitely a break of um, the skin and there will be physical scar and um, psychological uh, scar as well and trauma. So that right. So, know, that so is we, quite we've evident. been using this system for a while now. Um, what are the alternatives that are being considered, or if nothing is being considered, then what should be considered uh, that would be effective? 
Oh, definitely. There's we can look into alternative sentencing punishment. Okay, um, Saudi Arabia itself has abolished caning in 2020. UK has abolished caning, and we're still holding on to this colonization uh, form of punishment. So we can look at um, alternative sentencing, such as um, um, unpaid work, community service. Um, uh, probation, um, uh, diversion programs, and all these programs encourage a person to uh, integrate in the society, think about what they've done, and show remorse. Okay, so that's much better than being cane. It doesn't uh, um, serve any purpose except for inflicting harm to the person. Right. Um, one Junaidi says the law should afford the power of discretion to judges, especially in sentencing. What are your thoughts around this? Well, I look at this as a step towards a right direction, a step towards a humanitarian movement. Although I would like to see abolishment as a, as a whole in total, but perhaps just giving that discretion to the judge would be a, a, first, a, a, a first step. It's still a positive and proactive act, and it can also reduce this overcrowding in prison as caning serves as a supplement to the prison sentence. So abolishing caning or giving that discretion to judges uh, would um, uh, fall in line with at least the international human rights norms against corporal punishment. Right, so we talked about alternatives. Um, would there be any particular alternatives or examples that you could cite at this point, knowing that other countries have already abolished uh, this particular punishment system? There are, there are alternative sanctions, probation, fines, restitution, community service, uh, deferred adjudication programs. All these ac actually contribute to the society and help in the rehabilitation of the offender. So if you look at caning, what does it prove? It, it, there is no evidence to show that caning has uh, uh, been successful in deterring uh, offences. Um, people know, like you said, caning has been around for so long, but do people commit crime? Yes. Uh, do they fear um, uh, caning? Yes, they do, but they still do it. So it's not a total fear. It does not deter a person from committing crime. So we need to move away to, um, and look at alternative sentencing that can really um, integrate the offender with the uh, society and, um, um, and give them remorse for them to show them, uh, the offenders to show remorse for their act. But this, this change is going to take some time. How do you see us sort of trying to um, uh, handle the situation or trying to promote um, this change uh, in the interim uh, for the short term? Of course, there will need to be uh, serious and more discussions around this. Um, all suggestions would then will need to go through the proper procedure, need to go to um, the AG's office, and then um, laws need to be changed, need to be examined, revamped, and then it will have to go to parliament for the change, and of course, there will be debates before this can kick start. Zrina, thanks for doing this. Uh, that was Dr. Hazrina Begum, Abdul Hamid, criminologist and senior lecturer with the Faculty of Law at UM. I'm off to a quick break right now. When I come back, I'll take you around the globe and what's happening the world over. The International, up next. We begin the international with this. During his nightly address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky had this to say. Donbass is almost destroyed by Russia's strikes and that Russia had absolute disregard for the value of life. Four cities are close to ruins. Zaporizhia, Orykiv, Kharkiv and Donbass. Zaporizhia authorities handed out iodine tablets on Friday in the city's eastern Kortyski district as fears of a nuclear accident remained high. Zaporizhia city is located 55 kilometers northeast from Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Enerhodar, currently occupied by Russia. The nuclear plant remains close to the front line and has come under repeated fire in recent weeks, raising fears of a nuclear disaster. 
Libya's capital was quiet yesterday, a day after the worst fighting there for two years, killing 32 people and injuring 159, as forces aligned with a parliament-backed administration failed to dislodge from the Tripoli-based government. The fighting has raised fears of a wider conflict in Libya over the political standoff between Prime Minister Abdul Hamid al Baba in Tripoli and Fatih Bashhaga, who sees to install a new government in the capital. According to its foreign minister, Pakistan needs financial help to deal with devastating floods, hoping for financial help from the IMF or, or other organizations. This week, it launches an appeal asking UN member states to contribute to relief efforts. Bhutto Zardari, the son of assassinated Nazir Bhutto, says the country needs to look at how it will handle the impact of climate change. Economic impact is estimated at $4 billion. In Jordan, its director of uh, Department of Antiquities reports this. Preparations are underway to nominate Um El Jamal for UNESCO's World Heritage Site. Located in a remote desert in the north of Jordan and comprised of basalt constructed set settlements, a communal water system, churches, cemeteries and military forts, Um El Jamal was occupied and built by many civilizations, including the Nabataeans, Romans, Byzantines and Umayyads. The thing that distinguishes it the most is the architecture, its nature and its location in such a remote area. The combined SLS Orion spacecraft is due for blast-off from the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral today, sending the uncrewed capsule around the moon and back to Earth on a six-week test flight called Artemis 1. NASA's Artemis program, named after the goddess who was Apollo's twin sister in Greek mythology, aims to return astronauts to the moon as early as 2025 and establish a long-term lunar colony of, as a stepping stone to even more ambitious future voyages, sending people to Mars. The mission is NASA's first mission to the moon in 50 years. And with what's trending on social media and on Twitter, these are names trending, of course, Blackpink's Lisa. She's won an award for Best K-Pop at the VMA. Also trending in Malaysia is Zahid and Amno. Manu is also trending in a big way. They apparently had a good weekend. Clean sheet and all. Well done, boys. Well, that rounds up the brief on a Monday. Hey, Hari Kabangsaan is fast approaching. The hashtag and the theme, Kalwarga Malaysia, the go for summer. Make sure you have that on all your social media postings. Before I let you go, join my colleague Pasha Rahim on The Nation at 3 p.m. later today. She speaks to Said Sade Albar, the co-founder of Project Alima Tujo. The topic is pretty simple but deep. They'll be discussing this, celebrating Malaysia. I'm Jessie Chahal. Thanks for watching.